General Adwalia, uh, missing, but uh, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very, very authoritative presentations uh, proceeding, and I think uh, General Saha mentioned that hybrid warfare had been mentioned a hundred times over the past uh, uh, day and a half. So uh, my task has been made uh, fairly easy. Instead of trying to take you through everything I have uh, prepared, I will uh, flag the few uh, issues that I feel are important uh, when we talk about uh, my subject, which was technology, terrorism, and social media in hybrid warfare. I prefer the expression unrestricted warfare. Uh, General Sharma had spoken very, uh, I think, in extreme detail about the distinctions between grey zone and uh, uh, hybrid warfare. Uh, I think uh, the, the uh, concept I perhaps uh, evolved uh, by a couple of uh, uh, People's Liberation Army uh, chair, uh, uh, colonels in China of unrestricted warfare is perhaps what we should be very much more uh, familiar with now. Many of you will be aware of uh, the concept and will have read the uh, literature on the subject. And I would uh, agree again, I think that was a suggestion that came from the chair, that this is something that should be taken to the civil administration and political leadership because uh, this is less and less uh, a purely military affair. It is a national uh, challenge that we are facing. and. Uh, it is an institutional challenge. It's something that our system and government are no longer capable of responding to because they do not have the institutional framework. And the institutions that we have are rapidly being eroded by patterns of uh, authority which are more and more tribal, more and more individual in their orientation. This is not unique to India. It is unfortunately the nature of uh, political activity across the world. Uh, what precisely are we looking at? Hybrid warfare, uh, grey zone uh, operations, all seem to suggest a beginning and an end. When we speak of unrestricted warfare, we speak of, first of all, no limits of morality, scruple, value, no limits on the instrumentalities you may employ. Everything is to be harnessed against the adversary. Number two, the time frames are completely flexible, in fact, indeterminate. The distinction between the civilian and the warfighter is wiped out. Much of what is called unrestricted warfare, much of what is called hybrid warfare, gray zone operations, are today being performed by people who are not within the organized military forces of the countries that we are speaking of. Crucially, the battlefield is everywhere. There are no demarcations. I think uh, General Basniat perhaps spoke of uh, the borders are the same, but the geography has changed. The battlefield is not just within, not only on the borders, not only within fighting forces, not only within government institutions, they are right in your drawing room, in your bedroom, in your TV uh, station, on your computer. Very crucially, and this is what paralyzes many of us in our responses, many states. The ambiguity, again, something that uh, General Sharma, I think, spoke of uh, with great uh, uh, clarity. The ambiguity is such that many target states often celebrate the very factors that are destroying them. And India is a case in very obvious point. Today we celebrate the cheap goods that we are importing and rebranding and selling as Indian products. We are looking at GDP growth, which is actually undermining our own production capabilities, our industrial capabilities. We do not understand the integral nature of state power. And the nature of state power is a military, industrial, bureaucratic, technological, educational complex. Now start looking at each of these components and ask yourself, are we stronger in any one of these today? In relative terms, don't tell me we're better than we was, were last year, but in relative terms of where our adversary powers or our competitive powers or the powers we seek to match when we speak of our ambitions as an emerging great power. And ask yourselves, on any of these parameters, 
do we re really meet with international standards? Uh, time frames, as I said, unrestricted warfare is conceptualized as a completely relentless, enduring conflict, not only over years and decades, but even over centuries. Those who are conceptualizing these con uh, 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 the, the idea of unrestricted warfare are actually thinking of a civilizational war, something that carries on as long as any civilization conceived of as adversarial or outside the host civilization is to be destroyed. And it is at that point in this totalitarian victory that this conflict would end. We are also looking at a world, and the technology subject has been brought up, and I'm sure it has been brought up constantly over the last uh, uh, couple of days. Uh, we are looking at a, something that Bruce Hoffman, I think, called the technology treadmill. Even to stand in the same place, you have to keep running. I would emphasize that this is an accelerating technological treadmill. What we are seeing is the pace of technological advances advancement is becoming faster and faster. And unless you run that much faster, you will get thrown off the system. We have been thrown off the system. I say this as a sweeping generalization. I would be happy to take it up in detail later on. Now we talk about, I come to my principal focus, which is social media and what is happening. I would like to, uh, I think uh, uh, General Basniath came out with a uh, formulation where he said we need sober, reliable intelligence in assessments. He was talking about a global uh, system. I would like to suggest that almost everywhere when we talk of terrorism, when we talk of uh, all these various conflicts, when we talk of the social media in particular, uh, assessments have largely been hysterical. Sobriety is lacking, information is lacking. Understanding at the most basic level of these instruments is completely lacking. First of all, I'd like to say that you have to distinguish between message and medium, and we are not doing so. We talk about social media as, it is, as if it is a single complex. It isn't. There is a message, there is a medium. Furthermore, we must understand that subversion is something that has happened very for, right through history. It's not something that started with the social media. You have had far more dramatic revolutionary transformations, violent revolutionary transformations at various stages of history when the social media was not even imagined, leave alone being developed. Uh, you can come across many, many such examples, but I find one very interesting. Christianity. For 300 years, the Roman Empire outlawed Christianity on pain of the most painful deaths, torturous deaths, for 300 years. 50 years after it was legalized, it became the state faith of the Roman Empire. So there is something you must understand. There is an idea which, in a particular environment, will find its medium. And this is very, very important, that the social uh, and political context is decisive. The Roman Empire is crumbling, all sorts of transformations, new peoples are coming in. How do you manage them? You need a new instrumentality to control, a new ideological framework to manage populations. And Christianity at that point of time became that framework of social management. It didn't have a social media there, it didn't even have a printing press in play. Everything was by face-to-face -face word of mouth. So you must understand, it's not the medium that is the most powerful. It is the message, it is the moment, it is the social and political context that matters. Uh, I think very often many of us exaggerate the importance of social media because we don't understand it. Social media is not just an opportunity for an adversary, it is an opportunity for us. But because I don't understand it, because I don't know how to manage it, manipulate it to my advantage, all I can think of is shutting it down, banning it, stopping other people from using it. And that isn't going to work. That is the principle, not necessarily the exclusive, but the principal pattern of response for most states, certainly for the Indian state. Uh, one point that I'd like to make is the idea of cyber radicalization. 
I would like, I am tempted to make a sweeping generalization that there is nothing called cyber radicalization. Uh, let me be a little more moderate, let us say, cyber radicalization is something that is very, very rare. What you actually have is cyber mobilization or cyber recruitment. I think others have spoken before me. Uh, Chris Fair also said that almost everything LET does is face to face. But even everything, even people who are being recruited to the Islamic State or mobilized for the Islamic State or inspired, as they constantly say, by the Islamic State, these are not innocent Muslims who are sitting there, perhaps because all innocent Muslims are jobless, uh, looking for a job on the uh, internet, and they suddenly come across IS literature thrown at them by, in a mysterious way, and they become radicalized. No, these are already radicalized individuals who are engaged in directed seeking behavior. They are looking for this material. Why is this important? It's important because, again, uh, as technology grows, I remember pre-9-11, uh, if you looked at Western literature, the overwhelming proportion of let Western literature on terrorism was about cyber terrorism. It's the easiest thing to study. Like Chris Fair sitting in the Library of Cong Congress. <laughs> with, uh, you, you can just sit at your uh, home and, and become an expert on terrorism. You don't have to look at the field. You don't have to look at kinetic operations. You don't have to look at ground situations. And so, Technical and technological competence in this small group of experts creates a bias. So we keep talking about social media management, so social media radicalization, cyber radicalization, whereas the base problem remains on the ground of people, of social environments, of people who are being radicalized, call it pre-radicalized, call it non-violent radicalization. But the mindsets are being created in conventional social circumstances, social environments. Now it's very easy to talk about the terrorists and their efforts. This is obvious. The Islamic State sends out all sorts of literature. Why do people read this literature? There is so much falsification, so much twisting of the Quran, of, the his of history, or of whatever other literature, of, of Maoist literature, of whatever my ideological proclivities may be. We talk about the inability of the young to distinguish between fake news and real news. Why has this come into existence? We have today an ecosystem, a comprehensive enveloping ecosystem of political falsification. Lies are not just being spoken by terrorists, by subver those who seek to subvert order. Lies are constantly being spoken by those who hold state authority. We have no figures in authority who we can trust. We have no way left to distinguish between institutions who we can believe in and institutions that are falsifying. There is not a single untainted institution left not in India, but in the world today. Because this is something that is happening everywhere. But uh, that qualification is not necessary. It is happening overwhelmingly and terribly within India. So let me not pretend that we are just part of a global problem. Fake news is not a crisis of the social media. Fake news, unverifiability, falsification of narratives, is only being carried by the social media. It is being manufactured in the system. It is not being manufactured in some subverted, quiet, secretive, terrorist organization. It is being manufactured in the most august institutions of society today. What I'm trying to emphasize over here is that we underestimate the social in social media. The overwhelming emphasis is on the nature of the media, on the technical elements of the... It's easier to talk about these things. It's easier for technical people to talk about these things. Because if we start talking about the social in social media, we'd have to actually address all the warts on our own faces 
and that is always always problematic we have to ask ourselves moreover what are the social dynamics the social media is right across the world but how do you explain to me that a country like belgium with 400 million muslims in its population since 413 foreign fighters to the islamic state and the total outflow from india my last figures are 111 who went to join the islamic state in iraq syria and afghanistan not all of them were fighters many of these were fi uh, women and and uh, <coughs> children and we have a population approaching or exceeding 200 million muslims so we again i bring you back to the same thing there will be a local dynamic there will be a social dynamic there will be particular things happening in particular ghettos or institutions within certain ghettos and if we do not understand the distinctions between these we will keep on misdirecting resources and misdirecting efforts having said that let me also concede that there is a tremendous problem the scale of the problem as far as social media is concerned and controlling social media is concerned is is daunting at first sight and it is daunting as long as our response mechanisms remain primitive just a few little uh, uh, statistics you have about uh, an average of 350000 tweets per minute going out that makes it 184 billion per year you have 300 hours of video uploaded to YouTube per minute. That makes it about 432,000 hours per day, 157.6858 million hours per year. Facebook has, sees 429 billion comments, status updates and photos per year. Very clearly, this is a tremendous challenge. Within this is this very small component of extremist or terrorist literature or uh, material being put out. This is also fairly significant in terms of the peak period of uh, 2016 as far as the Islamic State is concerned. And we speak of the Islamic State because it has been the most efficient organization in terms of the use of social media. Uh, in just 30 days uh, in, in that uh, uh, Daesh was monitored in one study, uh, Daesh created and posted 1,146 separate units of propaganda this is not the total number of posts because they would have been posted and reposted again and again uh, all of them as you know uh, the the uh, daesh propaganda machine was extremely efficient extremely uh, sophisticated all of these were very well executed very well uh, produced uh, these were very widely reposted again uh, in 2016, on the average, Telegram, uh, on Telegram, Daesh was posting more than 30,000 messages per week. Now, this would seem to be a, a fairly uh, uh, overwhelming flow. Uh, but we see already that social media, and I'm jumping uh, many, many things here, that social media uh, platforms have begun to respond very rapidly to these challenges and they are able I, I my personal assessment is the social media are going uh, a little too far overboard in uh, 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 censoring even s critical or dissenting speech uh, uh, in in most states and uh, are permitting majoritarian extremism far more than they are permitting uh, any kind of even legitimate dissent in most states uh, but if we let's look at uh, uh, the the uh, kind of responses in terms of quanta uh, that the social media have already initiated we see that between uh, the data I have is uh, between august 2015 and december 2018 twitter suspended 1.4 million terror linked accounts uh, in 2017, the UK Home Department said that companies were taking down roughly two-thirds of terrorist material within two hours of discovery. Not only is this being done, you must understand how very possible this is. Uh, <clears throat> Between March and June 2018, we saw 1,348 uh, uh, videos uploaded to YouTube uh, by the Islamic State in a multiplicity of accounts. The total view on average was 121 views each to all these videos. That's the real impact. 24% of these remained online. 76% were taken off in less than two hours. 
half the uh, uh, removed videos had less than 10 videos uh, views each understand the kind of control that is being exercised and can be exercised uh, I, I won't go through too much of the other uh, 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 data there is similar and uh, a, a great deal of uh, uh, data which shows how much work has already been done uh, in these uh, uh, in this sphere by the social media platforms constantly uh, consequently the constant breast beating by governments that uh, social media are not doing enough uh, that government needs more and more powers to suppress this uh, discourse is largely uh, misinformed if not uh, uh, deceitful or intentional in terms of its distortions. Uh, unfortunately, of course, one has to concede that an overwhelming focus of the social media has been largely on the Islamic State because the most powerful countries of the world uh, did focus on the Islamic State. Nevertheless, we have, uh, 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 we monitor, for instance, some of the Islamist groups, but we very closely monitor in a new project that uh, we have put up, uh, Khalistani literature. And we found that the uh, Khalistani material on the social media, and we find that, that it has, number one, extremely small presence, and number two, it is removed very, very quickly, so quickly that it is becoming a nuisance for us. And this is something we fail to understand. The power that states, as well as research organizations, derive from monitoring this mat uh, material. We emphasize the fact that the Kashmiris you have been using social media to gather these flash mobs of stone pelters wherever there is an operational problem, wherever a, a, a military operation is taking place. And yes, this is a very serious problem for the army or for the security forces uh, responding. But have you ever understood or tried to tap the sheer quanta of datum that you could, data you could gather of this very easily using artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence tools which are not at the cutting edge of science which fairly rudimentary I, this is not my specialization but I know people who would do it very easily could give you and the degree of advanced warning that you could generate the minute social media activity flares up in or around a certain area you could identify where the mobilization is you could intervene on social media either to misdirect responses or to contain responses before they have reached where they are intended to reach. You are in your fear and your inability to handle the medium, relinquishing tools to the adversary which you would be far more able and powerfully able to exploit. You are the state. You are not some two-bit little organizations running around. The problem is, and I think this was mentioned earlier, uh, when we talk about educating uh, administrators, educating uh, politicians, that is where the gap in capability, competence, I would even say the gap in imagination. I think the 9-11 Commission uh, came out with that wonderful phrase. It was a failure of imagination. We have a colossal, comprehensive failure of imagination ongoing even today. We need to understand the nature of the discourse on social media. If we understand, the, and I'm talking about the subversive discourse or the terrorist or the extremist discourse uh, on social media, we need to understand the characteristics of this discourse and then devise tools for intervention. They are not difficult. They're being used constantly all the time. You go visit one website today or you go looking for one product today, within 15 minutes, the next time you go online, an advertisement has come in asking you to buy a product related to the product you've looked for or drawing you towards a discourse that seems to coincide with your interests. And if I have several such interventions on your part, it becomes easier and easier for me to discover, predict, and feed your expectations and your own interests. Uh, we, we are talking about here the entire system be having a whole range of filter bubbles. They filter material and give you what you want. And that is how, in some sense, cyber radicalization, mobilization occurs. Somebody looks for an Islamist terrorist site. 
and immediately he is directed to more and more such material. But if he is directed to more and more such material, I should be very easily able to identify who this individual is, where the material is originating from. And usually the source nodes are a very small number. This is true of uh, uh, the Islamic State. It is very much true of other groupings. As I said before, we monitor the Khalistani uh, 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 social media uh, discourse. And we found that uh, uh, over a period of nine months that we uh, monitored all tweets, something like two and a half million tweets uh, were, were uh, downloaded and uh, uh, analyzed, uh, not individually, but uh, uh, by uh, uh, intelligence systems. Uh, only eight principal sources were putting out the original material. Occasional messages may come from others, but eight sources were put, uh, putting out an overwhelming proportion of all the material that is coming out. So you, if you don't understand the magnitude, everyone is talking about this explosion of material on Khalistan. But the reality is there's no explosion. There is a, a perception bias. I'm looking for that material and I see it every day. Consequently, I think there is a whole lot. But when you look at their media presence, it isn't important. It is directed, but it is very small. We must understand the nature of the uh, content. We must, first of all, and most importantly, narrow the gap between the pace of technological transformation and our reactions, first and foremost at the level of policy, which is the most difficult. Adaptations by pro professional organizations will occur overnight. If you are as, as uh, army or as particular institutions in the civil sector are given a mandate, you will adapt. You will find the right people. You will put them in the right places. What I have seen more and more uh, very often in police organization, and I will co uh, conclude here, uh, is that uh, people who have the capabilities and the training, people who go abroad for uh, specialized training in, in uh, cyber or security, come back and start managing traffic. That's a problem of, of, of uh, management. It's a problem of the model of governance. And I think unless we change that base model, change our reaction times to these challenges, we will continue to fail. We are certainly failing at present. Thank you very much.